Hey, I'm Nicole, your host of the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. On this show, we're going to be talking tangible action that you can take in order to achieve the life you thought was only achievable after retirement. Everything you want now in life, you can have it. Will it take hard work, patience, and uncomfortable growth? You bet it will, but it will be so worth it. On this show, we will be deep diving into the topics of lifestyle design, travel, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. I myself am a global citizen and world traveler who left my home country and conventional lifestyle behind for a life of adventure and following my passions. And that's exactly what I want for you. It's your time to love your work, build your wealth, and create the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. Let's do this. Welcome to the Work, Wealth, and Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Nicole, aka Nomad Neeks, and I am so excited to dive into this episode where we're going to chat a lot more about travel hacking and point hacking with our guest today, Ginny. Ginny has always had a passion for traveling and for saving money. When she found out she could combine her two passions in the form of travel hacking, she was hooked. With the world of points and miles, Ginny and her husband have traveled home to visit family, stayed at an all-inclusive resort for zero dollars, and most recently visited Ireland on points. Ginny loves to share her travels and teach others how to travel hack too on both Instagram and TikTok. Ginny, welcome to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. Jenny, thank you for being on the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast today. I am so excited to chat travel hacking, travel points, and business and entrepreneurship along with that. So before we get into all of the good stuff, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your story, your background, where you started, and how you got to where you are today. Thanks, Nicole. I'm so excited to be here. So I got into travel hacking. It was probably 2021. One of the major credit cards that a lot of people start recommending travel hacking with the Chase Sapphire Preferred had this huge sign up bonus and we were thinking about doing it and we're like, you know what, we're just going to take the leap and do it. And it's very addicting, but a little bit of a backstory with that. I've always had a passion for traveling. Growing up, I didn't really have the opportunity to travel. A lot of times we would just go down to the shore as us Philadelphians say, um, or the beach. And then as I got into college, I got the travel itch, but it's expensive. And I've always been into saving money. Back in the day, I actually was an extreme couponer. So when I found I could travel and then also take that huge savings aspect of it with travel hacking, I was hooked. Um, And after we got that first card, I have never looked back. We just love using those points to be able to travel the world. Wow, that's so cool. And I'm sure that that's such a great feeling when you see the price and then you see the price with the points or whatever it is that you have accumulated. And I'm sure that's just a wow feeling. For sure. So for us too, we live in Florida and our family's back up in um, the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. So even just covering those flights to go home are huge because they can add up quick. I mean, it's Drew and I, it's two of us, two round trip tickets and the way domestic prices have been right now. We we're saving like two or three hundred dollars. So that's something to definitely keep in mind with travel hacking. Wow. Yeah, I feel like flights and I mean the price of everything has gone up so much, but I'm sure flights is probably one of those areas that was kind of a luxury and a little bit of a more expensive section of your budget and everyone's budget to begin with. And I'm sure it has definitely gone up. So how did you get started when you were thinking, you know, I love travel and I like the idea of being able to redeem some points and get some money off. But what did that look like really for you? Was it you found the credit card and you were just like, okay, I'm going to figure it out as I go? Did you research it? I know there's a lot of resources out there to help get started with travel hacking. How did you really get started in that space for you specifically? So we actually started on a personal finance journey before we got into travel hacking. And I find that's how a lot of people start. So I had just gotten out of college. I was working a residency job and my husband and I were trying to just get our finances on track, get a hold of our student loans. So we really focused on that. And I, with bits and pieces, I would learn about travel hacking. I'm like, hmm, this sounds interesting, but we just weren't in a place where we could handle credit cards. And then it got to a point where we were like, you know what, we're ready. Let's take the leap. Let's take it, start with that one card. Just kept going from there. 
Cool. That's awesome. So I have to ask, how many cards do you have now that benefit the travel hacking? Oh my goodness. I'm trying to think. (laughs) So I will preface this with, you do not have to be like me. You can travel hack with opening two or three cards a year. Between my husband and I, we're probably at like 10 or 12. But again, we've been doing it for a year and a half, almost two years now. Wow. Oh my gosh. That is a lot. So I think whenever I think of travel hacking, I feel like I always get some anxiety because I think of all of the remembering and planning that you have to do to know I have to spend this much on this card and I can get the points on this card at X amount of dollars. So how do you keep track of all of that, especially with 10 to 12 cards? So there's a couple different apps that I love to use. The first is Travel Freely. So with that, you enter in all your credit cards when you opened it, what the sign up bonus was, and it will remind you like, hey, you have so many days to meet the sign up bonus. Have you done it yet? Or hey, this card's coming up for an annual fee. What are your thoughts of, do you want to renew it? Do you want to see if you can get a um, retention offer? And then another app I love to use is the Card Pointers app. So you input all of your cards. And for both of these apps, you don't have to put in any secure information. And say you're going to the grocery store and you're like, which card should I use? And it'll be like, This month, use the Chase Freedom Flex. Um, So it's a great way to keep organized, especially when you get to those six, seven, eight number of cards. Wow. Yeah, that's really helpful. I had no idea that there was an app out there that would actually tell you, hey, use this card. That is super helpful. I'm sure otherwise it can get pretty crazy to to compartmentalize all of them. So let's chat some common misconceptions that are often associated with travel hacking. Um, I know that you probably have a few that come to mind, but I think sometimes there are common misconceptions, especially at face value when someone just sees, oh, I do travel hacking. Well, I'm sure that there are some things on the back burner that come into people's minds that maybe are not true or a little bit more negative. So walk us through what some of those are. So I think the number one thing when I tell people I travel hack, they're like, well, you must be in a ton of credit card debt, which is not the case. That's rule number one of travel hacking. Always pay your credit card in full. And if you're not at a spot like my husband and I were a couple years ago to where we could handle those credit cards, just don't open one and get to a place where you're ready to do it. I'd say another one, people think it's a scam, which it's not. I mean, these credit card companies put out these cards. They offer these nice sign-up bonuses. They have these nice multipliers. And if you use it with your everyday expenses and then pay it off when the statement comes due, you have those points that you can use for travel. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think that um, those are probably, for me, what I would think would be the biggest misconceptions. Now, what about having to spend a lot of money in order to actually get the points? That's a great question. So the cards depend, like the different, the cards have different signup bonuses. So some say the Chase Sapphire preferred right now is spend $4,000 in three months and you get 60,000 points. So that's $4,000 over three months, which is a little over $1,000. But when you get these cards, I put everything on them. So gas, groceries, bills, hospital bills, or whatever comes up. Also, too, some of them do have a higher sign-up bonus. So I recommend trying to time those cards when you have a purchase coming up. So for instance, my husband and I purchased a house last year. And during the house buying process, you can't open any credit cards. But then the minute the house closed. We were like, we have some big expenses coming up. So let's maximize and really work on getting the most bang for our buck points wise. And so what would you say is a starting point that somebody like, let's say if somebody wants to spend $300 a month, would they be able to get started travel hacking? Or do you kind of have to have a minimum that you know you're going to be spending per month or per quarter, whatever that looks like to actually open these cards and start getting these points? So you can definitely start with that. There's a card in the Chase family called the Chase Freedom Black so the Chase Freedom Unlimited. The nice thing with those are they are no annual fee cards. They are marketed as cashback cards, but once you hold a Chase Sapphire card, like the Preferred or the Reserve, you can go ahead and combine those points and use them for travel. So definitely you could get comfortable with them, work on building your credit, work on building those points, and then when you're ready, jumping in on that Sapphire product. And then some of the other banks out there too also have no annual fee cards. Um, I think it's like a City Double Cash, and there is an Amex one as well. So what would you say overall, and you mentioning all of these cards, which I love. But as a general, what would you say is one or two of the best cards that you could possibly have to really maximize your points? That's a tough one. But I would definitely say the Chase Sapphire Preferred, I know I mentioned it a lot, but it's a great starter travel credit card. 
for me, I love using chase points for Hyatt stays. Um, that's where all of our chase points go as well. And it has a low annual fee of $95. And it's just their card is just very easy to use. It's very easy for redemptions. But another card I would recommend is the Capital One Venture card. And again, it has a $95 annual fee, so it's low. It's a great starter card. I believe the sign-up bonus is around 75,000 points, but that card earns 2x on everything. So it's just easy. You just go and swipe your card. You don't even have to think about multipliers or anything like that. And then you can just watch the points roll in. Hmm. Wow. I feel like there's there's so many options out there. And I know you've definitely been in this game for a while. So you know what all of those options are. Um, so I want to ask you, in you saying all of this, now I know some of these cards have an annual fee. So of course, by paying that fee, you really want to maximize that card and make it worth it. Of course, this will vary depending on everybody's spend for the year, but an average family or person in America spending on their rent, their groceries, what do you think you would be able to redeem at the end of one year of using, let's say, a few of these key cards that you have mentioned? Let Would you be able to get like a round trip flight or would it be round trip in hotels or a one way or three round trips? What does that look like on average for just the average spend, average family? I would say for the average family, they could probably get like, say they had two adults and two kids. They could definitely get one vacation out of it where they cover their flights and the hotel. And another thing with travel hacking too is with most of these cards, they have a referral bonus and what we call two player mode. So say I open a card, Drew and I meet the sign-up bonus, and then I refer him to that card. He gets that sign-up bonus, but I also get those referral points as well. So it's a great way to boost your points um, if you have a player two that you can work with. Mm, Smart. I like that. Like hacking the travel hacking. I like it. (laughs) So if somebody is looking to get started travel hacking, what would you say are really the first steps? I'm sure it's not just go open up a bunch of cards. What would you recommend the first steps to be if you are interested in this world? Definitely take the time to read about it a little bit. There are some great starter guides out there with some of the major blogs like Upgraded Points, um, Travel Freely, The Points Guy. And there's tons of great resources out there too. The travel hacking space on Instagram is very, very helpful. We're a great small knit community who are always looking to help Um, one another. But one thing to keep in mind with credit cards, Chase has this like unspoken 524 rule. So that's why a lot of people recommend starting with it. But if you've opened five or more cards in the past 24 months, they will automatically deny your application. So something to keep in mind and try to calculate before you go to apply for that Chase card, because it may impact which cards you want to work into your travel hacking plan. Mm, interesting. I guess five cards is a lot within that short time span. So I guess that does make sense, but that is good to know. So transitioning from the travel hacking side to the business and entrepreneurship side. Now, I would love to chat with you about this as well. You have built a business out of credit card points and travel hacking. So walk us through where it really started in you doing your passion, travel hacking, and then where did the business idea of, you know, I can actually turn this into something as a full-time or a side gig. How did that start? What did that look like in your journey? So I created an Instagram last April. So my husband likes travel hacking, but he's not as obsessed as I am. And he was getting tired of me talking about it all the time. And I wanted to share our travels and like our tips and tricks with our friends and family. So I just created it, was sharing things like that. And then I built relationships within the travel hacking community. And then one day someone reached out to me and was like, hey, I'm looking for someone to help with a masterclass. Are you interested? And in that moment, I was like, oh my goodness, I am so scared. I am not ready for it. But I would say one lesson I learned from it is jump before you're ready because we're all going to make mistakes. You're going to mess up, but from it, you learn and you grow. Yeah, I really like that. So starting your business, did it start through Instagram? Was that really how you got started? Or what did that look like for you? Yeah, so I started on Instagram. um, And some people in the travel hacking space, so they offer, say, courses, sometimes they do master classes. So I just started sharing things. And eventually, like I said before, someone reached out about partnering with a class. And then from there, I was able to network more with that. And eventually, I got to a point I was like, I'm a host on all these masterclasses. Why can't I just own my host my own every month? 
and bring guests on it as well. So that's when I really took the leap and I was like, you know what, I can do this. And that's where I've grown my business from there. Hmm. Interesting. So my question within that is what challenges did you face growing a business, especially starting from Instagram? I'm sure you faced some challenges, but on your journey, what were some of the major challenges that really stood out to you in the beginning of being like, you know what, I can grow this into something. I've been on all these masterclasses and this can be something of my own. So what did that look like within your journey? So I would say I will preface this in that I have no business background. I'm in the healthcare field where I don't have any business responsibilities. So that was definitely a challenge trying to figure out how am I going to balance the work that I do and make sure that I get paid fairly while also providing good, helpful information to these people who are paying their hard-earned money to learn. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how did you find that balance? Because you're right, I'm sure not having a business background and and the healthcare is a totally different field. So you do different things every day. You're probably not even on your computer like you have to be to run a business, especially similar to what you're doing within your business. So what tools or resources did you utilize to really figure out what the heck you're even going to do in the online space and where to start your business? So I did a lot of research online trying to figure out, like I'm still working on my blog, but figuring out how to grow a blog, how to do SEO, how to grow a newsletter. Google was really my friend. But again, like the travel hacking space on Instagram, there's a lot of great content creators out there to help you learn and grow in your business. And I've also invested in some classes and trainings. So that's been helpful as well. It's definitely an investment, but I've definitely seen a return on it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's so interesting, you know, you not being just being in a very different field and having grown something of your own within the online space and something that you're passionate about that has nothing to do with your day job. So I love that. And that is super commendable. Um, So I would love to chat about how to not work for free. I think this can be I think this happens to honestly every single business owner, especially in the online space. It is so easy when people just come to you in your DMs or email you and it's like, yeah, I know how to do that. And I love talking about it. So let's chat. It can be so easy to fall into that trap. So what did that look like for you and how did you mitigate that? So I've had a few people. So one of the major parts of travel hacking that people struggle with is finding award availability, which we didn't touch on, but it it's hard to grasp the different transfer partners and things like that. And people will come to you and be like, I'm looking to fly from this to this on this specific date. Can you help me? And in the beginning, I'm like, yes, of course. Like I'm excited to have these people in my DMs. I want to build these relationships. But then you're spending like an hour, two hours, and you're like, I have responsibilities in my own life. Like I have a knowledge that these people would benefit from and I don't want to work for free. It's it's definitely something I still struggle with because I haven't encountered it, but I have heard of people receiving comments back like, well, you should help me kind of thing. Wow. So I'm curious, what did you do when people started to come to you and they were asking for free advice, which I think is is very human nature. You know, you see somebody, especially in the online space on social media, and it's like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. I'm going to ask her. So what did you do or what did you build within your business to mitigate that and to kind of direct people over to the paid side of your business? So I will, instead of like going through, like, say they wanted help with an award booking, I'll try to forget what the saying is, but like you teach someone how to lead to water. So I'll be like, this is what I would recommend doing. But in the past, I've also done a masterclass on how to book award tickets and it's available for purchase if that would help you. And sometimes I have been able to get people to convert and purchase it. And they actually come back and say, thank you for recommending this because I got way more out of this class than I would have gotten in a DM. Yeah, yeah. I love that you bring that up. And I think that is something that is very often overlooked when people come into your business looking for advice. Yes, you can, you know, audio them a one minute message or send them a long DM, but to actually for them to really get the value that they are wanting and to continue coming back in your world because you do provide such great value. Sometimes the best for them and for you is to really offer them something paid, not that it needs to be, you know, 
a million dollars. It can be a very affordable price point, but to make up for your time and, you know, the free content that you give on your Instagram is absolutely amazing. And so that's kind of the, the free content you give as the starting point. And then from there, it leads into um, really something that's paid that's a lot more in depth. So I'm sure that this was definitely, and I think with all online business owners, this is something that you kind of have to figure out on your own. Nobody really tells you or gives you a roadmap unless you buy a course, in which case, you know, that might be a different story. But I think it's something that we all kind of have to figure out on our own. I know years back, I'm thinking of my journey and I went through the exact same thing. Yeah, it's definitely tough, especially because yeah. I'm like the kind of person where I'm like, oh, I want to help you. Like, like I would do anything to help anyone, but it's like that backfires. And then when you're just spending so much time and you're like, I could be working on building my business to grow and help more people, then you realize what you should, you should not take all that time. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. And I think that is a good note and a good lesson for anyone listening who you are starting something of your own or you're wanting to start something of your own. You know, there comes a point when you have so much free content out there, it's time to make some paid content. So one thing you mentioned within that was talking about the transfer, I believe you called it, of points and let's say I'm, I have a bunch of points accumulated on a bunch of different cards. And I'm thinking I want to fly from LA to France, but I can only do it on February 18th. And I want to fly, you know, this airline. So how does that work when you have all these cards and all these points and you have a specific day in a specific place and I could just, my mind is in chaos right now. So how does that work? So when booking award tickets, I always recommend, if you can, try being flexible with your date, try being flexible with your destination, and even being flexible with your departure point. So my husband and I, we live in Orlando, which has some international flights, but you're probably going to get a much better deal if you fly out of, say, DFW, JFK, LAX, depending on where you're going within the world. With credit cards too, so these credit cards are trying to push you to book in their portal where you're either going to get anywhere from 1 to 1.5 cents per point, so it's not the best redemption. But if you look at those transfer partners, you can get a much better deal. So I've done like a couple of reels and posts on this, but there's been examples where say you wanted to do a weekend in Savannah, Georgia, and if you were to book in the portal, it's say 70,000 points. But since it's Hyatt and Hyatt has awesome redemptions, you can transfer to them instead and book it for, I think it was 30,000 points. So it definitely takes some time and trial and error to learn those transfer partners, but that's where you really get to maximize those points and miles. Hmm, Interesting. I had no idea about transfer partners. So if I'm starting out in this space, how do I learn about this? Do you have a course or where does somebody go to actually learn about what the heck transferring points is and who do you go to optimize your points? How do you really start to learn about that? So I do have a masterclass on master, it was called Mastering Award Flight Booking. So going through those different transfer partners and then also talking about alliance partnerships, which is like another step up to really maximize your points and miles. But there are tons of great resources out there. Say you wanted to travel to Greece, you could search how to use points and miles for Greece. And there's tons of great resources out there that will walk you through. If you have this card, look at this transfer partner, or if you have this other card, look here. And then too, there are also award search tools. So for example, one of them is point.me where you can put in, say I'm flying from Philadelphia to London and I have these points, which flights are available on this day. So, okay. So I have to ask, and you sharing everything that you have just shared in this episode, what is the best flight or reward that you have ever redeemed? So it's good, but it's also bad. So my husband and I recently just got back from Ireland. So we booked business class flights from Miami to Dublin round trip on Aer Lingus, and it was 62,500 points per person per way. Now, when we booked it, there was a 40% transfer bonus, which is another whole thing that to open up. It's like another can of worms. But basically, instead of transferring 1,000 points, you would transfer 1,000 points and get 1,400 points. So we ended up transferring about 179,000 points for this flight. Now, the taxes and fees can be a little bit higher when flying internationally. So it was about $160 one way per person. 
But the retail value of this flight was like $15,000, which is ridiculous. I don't know who in their right mind would pay it. I would never pay it. I know these airlines like to inflate the cost, hoping people would purchase it, but that was probably our best redemption. But the only downside coming back, our flight was miserable. It was horrible. Our seats wouldn't recline. They ran out of meals. So it was a little disappointing. Wow. $15,000 thousand dollars that's crazy okay so in you saying that i need to ask you about inflation of costs if that is anything that you have any knowledge about i would love to chat about that and backstory of why i'm asking this is because literally yesterday i booked a flight and then i couldn't book baggage and so i knew that i had to call them because i booked on a third party to book the baggage but then i saw after i booked that i could add on my one bag for 70 us dollars which was you know it was a short flight so that was about the cost of the flight um so i called them and I ended up paying $15. Actually, it was like 10 US dollars, 15 Canadian dollars, just because I called them and my bag wasn't the maximum weight. And I told them that and I was just mind blown. So talk to me about inflation of airline ticket prices. It's it's crazy right now. So we're trying to fly home in April since my sister's having a baby. And normally flights are landed a Philly round trip, maybe $300 cash. And I was looking at dates and for one way, I was like flabbergasted. American wanted a thousand dollars in economy for this two and a half hour flight. And I was like, no, we are not paying that. So this is another trick. It's not related to points and miles. So I found a cheap fare on Spirit. We're just going to do a personal bag. But if you buy it at the airport counter, you save on the passenger fee. So you save $23 a person per way. And is the keep in mind the same if you book online versus the counter? Yeah, it's the same. So we, the round trip for the both of us, I think it was like $300. But if we had booked it online, it was almost 400 Wow. Wow. I did not know that. All right. Well, this is great. Before we go, do you have any other travel hack or airline hack or tips for us? I would say for travel hacking, just take it easy. Take it one card at a time. Don't overdo it. Don't try to open like 10 cards at once, which I kind of tried to do because I just loved it so much. But also just keep an eye out for good flight deals, like with how we were talking about the prices are so expensive right now. I mean, look to go international as well. The flights are so much cheaper there than within the domestic United States. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that's good to keep in mind. Well, Ginny, thank you for being on the show. Where can people find you if they want to learn so much more about this world? So I'm on Instagram and TikTok at the Grady underscore bunch. Awesome. And then everything is linked down below. So you can check her out there and get to travel hacking. If this episode has served you in any way, I would love it if you shared what you've learned or a part of the episode that you loved by tagging me on Instagram at nomadneeks. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and leave a five-star review so that I can continue to bring you educational content, learn and grow together. Thank you for your support and see you in the next episode of the Work, Wealth and Travel podcast.